Hey everybody, welcome back to the Blackware Intelligence Podcast. Hope you're all doing well. Before we get into the show, let me tell you a little bit about our sponsor, FTX US. FTX US, one of the largest crypto companies in the United States, is the safest, most regulated way to buy and sell Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other digital assets. With FTX, you can trade crypto with up to 85% lower fees than top competitors. There are no fixed minimum fees, no ACH transaction fees, and no withdrawal fees. FTX has also recently announced their stocks beta rolling out to U.S. customers to enable crypto, stocks, and NFT trading in one interface. This includes hundreds of U.S. exchange-listed securities, including common stocks and ETFs, and an integrated experience within the existing FTX U.S. cryptocurrency trading application. Use promo code BLOCKWARE1 or go to ftx.blockwareintelligence.com to earn free crypto on every trade over $10. Again, that's BLOCKWARE1 or go to ftx.blockwareintelligence.com to get started today. Now let's get into the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. Today we have a very special guest for you guys, Jonathan Cheeseman. He goes by John. John, we've uh, gone back and forth on Twitter, uh, I want to say for several months now, and I always enjoy seeing your stuff. You know, for for people who don't know, you're behind the FTX Access account. Uh, You know, we really appreciate you coming on and taking the time amidst all this kind of craziness in in both the macro and uh, and crypto landscape. Yeah, it's... um... Thanks a lot for having me. Well, it's great, to, great to be on. You know, I've uh, similarly enjoyed reading your stuff on, uh, you know, on Twitter. Uh, you're definitely uh, by the time you get to uh, to, to to my age at uh, forty, almost a boomer. You'll be, uh, you know, who knows what you'll be, uh, what you'll be coming up with. It's, you know, it's very impressive to, uh, you know, see the progress and stuff you're making. It's great. Um, Thanks, man. Yeah, but in terms of uh, it being busy, uh, the combination of. Uh, wild global macro markets wild crypto markets and uh, working at ftx is uh, is you know is, is a reasonable uh, reasonable <laughs> busy schedule <laughs> yeah for sure i can i can only imagine i guess before diving into some hot topics um just kind of you know if you could give our listeners some context around what you do at ftx uh, sure. as i mentioned you run the ftx access account but maybe you know talk a bit more in detail about what your role is there yeah so I, i've been ftx for for a year now um predominantly on the institutional um, sales side, I guess that that's the main role. Um, so, you know, onboarding more traditional um, funds to, to FTX. But we also, you know, we decided to do a bit more than that a couple of months ago. Um, and FTX Access started, a, you know, a research product, which, um, you know, you see the, you see the stuff on Twitter. Um, there's going to be a, a, a website soon, which, you know, we're hoping is going to be pretty cool. We're going to make it like kind of a, community blog where, uh, you know, we get a lot of different contributions from, you know, different research firms, and we just try and kind of filter for the best stuff that we find find interesting, um, you know, but at the same time, you know, it's been one of the other reasons we did FTX Access was, um, you know, certainly I, you know, I have a macro background, and I realized just how much, how big of a driver the you know the macro cyclical move from the from the Fed was becoming for crypto, and I kind of just wanted to make sure, you know, we had a kind of voice, like kind of trying to translate that for the more crypto native um, audience, um, you know, because there I think, I think we kind of most of, hopefully all the listeners, most of the people in crypto, you know, believe that there are some longer term structural tailwinds. Um, you know, for crypto, for digitization, um, you know, uh, digital identity, um, and all those things will ultimately be quite bullish for crypto, um, but the, or hopefully very bullish for crypto. Um, but the, you know, in the short term, you do have to pay attention to these, to, to, to the macro cycles, um, because they can just be, they can be so vicious. Um, and you know, and and crypto in particular has this very reflexive tendency where you know things are either really good or really bad, uh, and, and you know can can really kind of snowball. So just to kind of stay alive, um, you know, you got to make sure that you you got to make sure you have an awareness of the macro. For sure. Let's go ahead and kind of dive in there. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to start with this idea I've been thinking about lately of. Bitcoin as kind of a leading indication of some of the macro conditions. You know, I think 
a lot of people have been talking about Bitcoin kind of failing as an inflation hedge. And, you know, we've got inflation at, you know, 40 year highs, yet Bitcoin has been performing, performing very poorly. Um, but I would kind of argue that Bitcoin has been serving as a debasement hedge, if anything. You know, if you look at 2020, Bitcoin was the, you know, strongest performing asset of all. You know, if you look at even, you know, the, the highest risk of, of tech stocks, you know, all, all these different types of assets, Bitcoin outperformed everything on that whole push from, you know, April, May of 2020 all the way to 2021. Uh, and was almost calling bullshit on the Fed saying that inflation was was transitory the whole time. Uh, and then on, on the backside of that, you saw Bitcoin sell off the most aggressively uh, at the end of 2021. So how do you kind of think of Bitcoin? I mean, you alluded to it a little bit in, in, in that um, in what you just said, but how do you kind of think of Bitcoin as this kind of macro indicator? And like as Bitcoin grows, do you think Bitcoin will be, you know, a macro indication just in the same way you look at the Dixie or the 10 year? Like, do you think as, you know, Bitcoin becomes theoretically a five, ten trillion dollar asset? Will that be something that you know all macro asset managers are paying attention to? Yeah, so um, I'd say what you know, Bitcoin. So so all assets, um, you know, are subject to uh, interest rate cycles and growth cycles. Um, so you have to, you know, both keep a keep keep a track on 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 growth global growth data and also um, you know global liquidity data. And liquidity is generally just a function of, of, of central bank policy. That can be interest rate policy, but also as we've become very accustomed to, you know, extraordinary monetary policy, because uh, once you cut to zero, you got to do something else, um, which has been, you know, the, the, just the creation of new money. Um, that's called, you know, mon monetary inflation. Um, and it was that that really got the kind of famous macro guys really excited about, about Bitcoin. And they thought that, in a you know in a world where new money is being created, um, Bitcoin will be you know Paul Tudor Jones wrote this famous article that Bitcoin will be the fastest horse, which which was correct. Um, and then I think, so I think when you think about crypto and in a Bitcoin and inflation, I think Bitcoin would be an inflation hedge if inflation was allowed to get out of control, um, but inflation that is under control. By aggressive central bank policy is not really great for you know great for any assets because um, you don't really need a hedge because the central bankers are doing their job to bring inflation back in into check and actually this is something that um, I think Kathy Woods actually talked talked about a while ago this kind of idea of like um, you know a V shaped argument where either in deflation or in uh, hyperinflation Bitcoin will do the best. Uh, and then, you know, in that middle ground, um, it will do it will do do less well because, um, you know, in the deflationary environment, central banks will just ease, ease, ease. And in hyperinflation, they've just given up and people need to own assets to, you know, to, to hedge. And, you know, a non fear asset would be, you know, would, 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 I guess, be in theory, the kind of the optimal, the optimal one to own. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's that's kind of how I think about it. Um, I'd actually say, I actually say, I, I that was kind of always my school of thought. Like it was either hyperinflation or deflation that was good for Bitcoin. So I'm not surprised it hasn't done well in an environment of of tempered inflation by 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 a central bank. Um, what I was a bit disappointed by was when you know the U.S. excluded Russia from SWIFT, um, and you know the like the kind of uh, the dollar as like a neutral settlement asset. Um, was kind of put into question um, that we saw not only an appreciation of the dollar, which uh, wasn't that surprising because it's against kind of weaker fiat currencies, and I can I can see why. Um, but the fact that in that you have like this window, and I'm I'm gonna lose track of dates. I guess it was something like probably probably for most of Q2, I think gold started out really well, and Bitcoin started out really poorly. I think that you know for any kind of Bitcoiner. Um, the fact that, you know, gold was was being treated as a kind of alternative to the dollar in a time of crisis for or in a time that the dollar was under threat, people were buying gold as a reserve alternative, but they weren't turning to Bitcoin. I, I was more disappointed that, that, that by that. It makes a lot of sense. And this next question, of course, you know, if anyone knew the answer, they wouldn't be recording on a podcast with me. They would be like sitting on a yacht somewhere. But how do you think through 
the Fed and interest rates moving forward. Um, you know, you hear some people saying that, you know, they're jawboning. You hear some people saying that they're basically on a revenge tour to reclaim their, their credibility after saying inflation was transitory throughout last year. Uh, I guess just from a high level, because I mean, you, know, you could talk about this for an hour, but how do you think about some of their decision making th- for the remainder of the year? And, and more importantly, what are some of the kind of indicators and metrics that you're kind of using to gauge potentially some of those de- decisions that they have to make? Sure. So I guess I guess when you think about um, when you think about Fed policy, um, cycles in asset prices and growth and employment are very normal. Um, that it's what they're meant to do when the economy is running hot. They're meant to slow it down. When the economy is running cold, they're meant to speed it up with 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 monetary policy. Um, the one thing they're really not supposed to do, and like the ultimate failure for for a central bank, would be to let inflation get out of control. So that's like just a real. That's such a red line for them, um, and I think they're still reeling from making such a big mistake uh, and, and, and starting the tightening cycle too late. So I think that's still very much in their mindset. I think it would be a mistake for any, I think it would be wrong to kind of say they're jawboning. I don't think that's true. I think they are very serious. Um, and I think that, you know, both jobs data and inflation data is, is, is too hot for them right now. And you know, rates um, you know just north of two percent is is isn't going to cut it. So I think you know they are still going to be hiking quite aggressively, um, and we could still have some disappointment to come. Um, you know, clearly the markets have you know the last few days taken. So I guess you had re- what has, what's happened in recent times is um, the market. Um, went from pricing an inflation shock, went from an inflation shock regime, which was um, commodities higher, yields higher, equity and crypto lower, um, to pricing kind of like a recessionary environment, which is yields lower, commodities lower. uh, And for a while, it was also crypto and equities lower too. But one of the things that you noted earlier is, uh, you know, that, that, that Bitcoin is potentially kind of a leading indicator for other asset prices, um, as are the kind of fringe tech companies. And the reason is, is that I think these are the most interest rate sensitive assets. Um, You know, those, at least on a relative basis, have done much better in the last week, um, as commodity prices have come a lot lower. I mean, oil, so oil uh, wasn't, um, not today, so yesterday, I think oil's move, it was like top three since like the 80s uh, in terms of percentage changes in oil. You've also seen massive decreases uh, across the commodity complex. You know, the other thing I suppose people are worried about is agricultural commodities uh, for, for food prices uh, because, you know, the, the shock of the Russia-Ukraine thing has been mostly on, on the supply side for energy and food. Now, what is quite interesting is you know, next week we get the CPI number, which I think most people expect to be, you know, similarly uh, hot to last month's. Perhaps we'll even get a hotter reading. But the interesting point here is everyone who sees, you know, who sees that the hot data on the inflation side, on the headline inflation side, will know that coming into the next month, uh, prices have moderated quite a lot. So I think, you know, I think we can say with some you know, some confidence that, you know, probably the high is in for yields now, probably the high is in for headline inflation. Um, and, the, you know, the market will turn its way back to, to focusing on core inflation, which is actually what the Fed usually focuses on. They're usually much less concerned about headline inflation, which is very volatile and usually self-corrects, and core inflation, which is much stickier uh, and, and can you know, can have to be be dealt with for uh, you know it's, it's harder to deal with because it kind of has what they call second round effects. They're usually very concerned, especially with um, with inf- with wage inflation. So those are a few things to watch uh, tomorrow. Actually, we get uh, the payrolls. The most important part of that data will be the average average hour, hourly earnings, which is um, the wage component of of, of payrolls. Um, but yeah, we might be moving to, I mean, I guess what's the best outcome for markets now? I think it's that growth data comes in, you know, fairly well uh, and, and inflation data isn't, isn't, you know, is less bad than it used to be. 
Um, but you know, you also have to be very careful and listen out to what to what the Fed are saying because I think you know it's been a buy the dip environment. Even though this year has been super painful, you know, it's been a buy the dip environment for you know I think it's thirteen years or something. So there's like kind of a Pavlovian like response from investors to kind of continually try and you know try and buy into weakness. And I do kind of worry a little bit that um, you know we might still be a little bit too optimistic. Um, but you know, but things are things are turning, right? I think you know, I think I think we are getting to a point where inflation seems seems under control, um, or is certainly looking to be getting closer to that. So that's certainly good news. Um, I don't think the Fed will pivot that quickly, but the market there's all there's still a lot priced in in the future for the Fed. So you know, as that pricing moves, uh, you know, the Fed have still got a lot of room to, to still cut a lot and still cut much less than the, sorry, to still hike a lot, but still hike less than the market has priced in. And that may be, especially for interest rate sensitive assets, that'll be, that'll be comforting. Um, yeah, that, no, that's super helpful. I guess my, my question to piggyback on that would be like, how do you think about volatility in, in broader markets moving forward? I, I sent you this chart moving, uh, yeah. it, it, you know, it was, it was basically the, the VIX and the move index and then like a FX volatility index. Um, and you know, they're moving significantly higher while the VIX is kind of just treading water. Uh, and it's it's been a bit strange that like, at least, you know, from, from you know, my, you know, short experience in markets that like, the VIX hasn't been following this aggressive move down in equities. Like it, it almost seems like a lot of the selling has just been very controlled. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of, you know, quote unquote, like panic uh, so far in the markets. Like, how do you think through volatility and like, why have we not seen a, a further spike in the VIX? And then I know I'm like throwing a lot here, but like as well, like do markets have to bottom with a VIX spike? Like, do we have to see some massive capitulation like down with the VIX spike? It's just, I don't know. It's just been strange to see that like dynamic. Yeah, no, it's weird actually. And uh, I remember I was I was reading a report not so long ago from the the Goldman put out that was um, that was saying that actually the best trade this year has been to be short um, to be short equities, but also short vol. That's been like an amazing like sharp return trade, which which is obviously really unusual. Uh, typically, you know, lower prices are, are, are get get you higher vol. I mean, the, the explanation that I have for this, um, and I have to say it's somewhat anecdotal, so um, I guess it's more of an observation on my part than like a, than a, than a hard fact. Um, but institutional money um, has really reduced equities super, really, really heavily. And some of the large institutional accounts are the very big buy, buyer of VIX or equity puts for hedging strategies. Uh, so if they don't have much to hedge, uh, they'll be buying less. They'll be buying less insurance for that. So I think that's. I personally, I think that's part of it. And also, kind of what stock pickers do is they buy. Um, you know, they top. They pick their top five equities. They buy those, and then they buy puts on the S and P. So they, you know, what the, their job is to, um, you know, is 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 stock is stock picking and to create alpha out of the markets and like remove beta. And those guys have also not only been killed, but have pretty light positioning too so i kind of feel like that doesn't worry me so much because I, I i feel like institutional money is just reduced really to the as low as it can get in equities um and retail hasn't so it's kind of like whoever whoever kind of kind of budgets budgets first on this and i think it's it's you know it's actually one of the biggest like showdowns we've ever seen between retail and institutional positioning, um, and I think like the institutional guys are kind of hoping they have retail trapped here over earnings season. Um, you know, next week's going to be a real challenge. We've got the CPI on uh, on the thirteenth, and then on the fourteenth we start getting um, the I think it's JP Morgan and Goldman report that either like fourteenth and fifteenth. Um, that's like the kind of when earnings season kicks off in earnest. And I think a lot of the bears are saying that, um, you know, earnings, earnings lower will force people to kind of put these, will make valuations look expensive again, because people obviously look at price over earnings per share. Um, and, and so that will make equities look, look expensive again. Kind of, I kind of get that. And I get that 
that's the case, but the market's a bit more forward looking than that. I don't think anyone's expecting these earnings to come in great. So maybe that's, you know, that sometimes the obvious trades work, uh, you know, but sometimes you have to keep an eye on, you know, you have, what, 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 what other people are thinking. And, you know, all the banks, for example, have quite high S&P forecasts for the end of the year, but they always do. So I don't believe that that's what actual market participants taking risk are using for their, uh, that, you know, using for, for, for their risk taking. So, you know, so it's going to be, it's going to be really, I mean, it really is. I mean, it's funny, actually, you could, it's just, you know, I've been in macro now um, for since 2003, uh, so almost 20 years. And like this, like kind of period from when we first, you know, COVID first started and all the traders were like, you know, like starting to get stats about how many Zoom, how many masks were getting ordered and like how much time was being spent on Zoom and like, you know, and people were running out trying to, you know, buy toilet paper and stuff like that. And really, you know, really since then, it's just been just the most fascinating and volatile macro environment. And that's, you know, that's over, over two years now. Um, and then, you know, just to go back to your point on volatility, like no question, usually high volatility is bad for markets um, because it can create like volatility shocks, which cause people to reduce their portfolios. The only thing that's like a bit weird now is the volatile moves have been bond yields lower and commodities lower. And like those, both of those moves have a potential reading to be good for like rate sensitive risk assets. Um, you could argue that you know we're about to be plunged by central bank hikes into this very deep recession. Um, if that's true, then I would say that's definitely not good for prices. Um, but if it's a little softer than that, then we'll see. I mean, while you know it is going to be, it is we are going into recession. Your last looks like probably the first three quarters of this year um, will will be negative for real GDP. Um, but the point you know, one of the things that you have to look at is nominal GDP is actually really high in the US, you know, we're growing in nominal terms at, at great rates. And, you know, asset prices are nominal asset prices aren't, aren't real. So I do think, I do think that kind of recessionary fear is, I mean, it's a technical recession, because of how crazy the data is at the moment. Uh, and you know, that I, maybe that kind maybe that catches people out. Yeah, no, that, that's super helpful. That makes a lot of sense. Um, the last thing I want to ask you about is we've talked a lot about macro. I want to touch on the crypto market a little bit. Uh, obviously, you know, there's been no shortage of, of talks about all these contagion fears. If I had a dollar for every time someone said the word contagion on Twitter, I'd be very rich. Um, how do you You'd think- be rich than if you've been trading crypto for the last year. <laughs> yeah, that, that's for sure. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> Short crypto, long, long contagion words on on Twitter. Um, <laughs> how do you how do you think through some of these contagion effects? I mean, I saw SBF had come out in an article, I believe it was on like Wall Street Journal or Business Insider, uh, and he said that he thought the majority of of some of these effects have kind of subsided. Um, you know, what do what do you look at, or or you know, is it just anecdotally uh, to to think about some of the the risk from from these you know knock on effects of what essentially has just been a you know complete collapse of of leverage and seems like a lot of the the counterparties that seem to be diversified ended up all kind of being the same ones yeah you know it's um it's pretty pretty shocking you know how many people you know it, there's just no there's no like uh one of the things in crypto is while it's, uh, you know, on a ledger and everyone kind of takes comfort that there's a lot of data available, there's actually a lot of data that's like not available as well. So uh, it's a bit of a risk that people assume that, you know, it can be more quantified than traditional markets. And one thing that clearly wasn't quantified was, you know, where, where liabilities were. Um, and, you know, you could take a, a loan from a lot of different people uh, without the others knowing. Though, you know, that's exactly what happened with Archegos. So it still happens in traditional finance too, not, not just crypto. Um, so I think, and then when you think about contagion, like there are two things, like there is, have we seen the full knock-on effects from a counterparty perspective? I.e., are there some people that are gonna, are there some, are there some bodies that are still gonna float to the surface, okay? That's one thing. And I'd say the answer to that is like, probably yes. Um, but the more important question is, 
like what is the selling associated with that? So there was obviously with the first round of liquidations, I'm sure there was a huge amount of selling, a huge amount of liquidation. Um, and I'd say, you know, we probably have seen the worst. We've probably seen the by far the worst of that selling at these prices. So, but, you know, if prices were to go down more, uh, you know, it's reflexive, uh, leverage is uncovered by losses. Um, so, you know, if we were to retest the lows and I don't know, people have been talking about, you know, Bitcoin below 15K or I mean, these are very, ETH below 700, these are very rough numbers. So I'm certainly not giving you any insight into where there are, you know, big liquidate on, on chain liquidations, but, you know, ballpark, like if we fell 25% from here, uh, you know, we'd be in a much different situation. And yes, the liquidations at these prices have been completed, but there'd be new ones from those prices. So I think, um, but that equally, that means if we do stay around here or see fresh inflows, you know, those liquidations won't happen. So they're not a problem. So I think that's, I think it is quite price dependent. Um, and, you know, you don't need, sometimes you don't need like buying for markets to base, you just need selling to stop. And especially if it's like very aggressive selling, um, of course, you know, you can, you can bounce on, on not that much. And, you know, one of the things that's, you know, in my other seat, like anecdotally that I see is, uh, you know, institutional money, like wasn't ever that big in crypto, I'd say. And, and I don't think they've been, I don't think they've been particularly put, put off by this either. So, you know, we're still, most of the conversation, well, in fact, I, I can't think of a conversation that we were having about onboarding that has, has stopped because of these market fears. I think a lot of people feel there are some opportunities being, you know, being created in, 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 in the medium term. And that may not be at these prices, it might be at prices a bit lower, but, but equally, it's not a, it's not, it's, there's a huge difference from 2018 where people were like, it's dead. It was stupid anyway. Like clearly Bitcoin's worthless. Ethereum, it doesn't work and blah, blah, you know, all these, you know, all, 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 all those kind of, and that may come back. I don't know. And maybe we need that. Sometimes some people say we need that to start hearing that more to, to bottom, but um, it's been, it's a very different environment here. And, um, while I wouldn't say people are buying aggressively, you know, they still want to be involved in the space. For sure. Hey, John, I want to say thank you so much for your time. I could talk to you for like two hours. I always love listening to all your insight. And for anyone listening, be sure to check out the uh, FTX access account. It's I believe FTX underscore access. John, yeah. I don't know if there's anything else you want to plug in or if you want to give any uh, last words, but yeah, we, we really appreciate you coming on the show. No, 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 that's great. Uh, you know, appreciate everyone listening. You know, feel free to ask questions on, on Twitter as well. And, um, you know, let's, uh, you know, uh, be careful out there with, with, with the risk. And, you know, hopefully there'll be a, a new bull market not too, too, too far away. You can only hope. All right. Thanks so much, Cheers. John. Take care. Thanks, Will. Thanks for having me.